good evening. It's good to see everyone here tonight. And uh, thank you for coming back to, to worship with us. And uh, I have to say, um, I heard the Midnight Special before, but mine was the Andy Griffith version. <laughs> I, I've seen that episode and I, I've listened to Andy sing that, uh, that song on numerous occasions. And uh, I, I'm not super old, but I'm, I'm old in that way. One of my favorite shows, it kills my kids to walk in and see me watching it because they know that the TV has been taken until I get tired of watching and I go to bed. And uh, so, um, and I did want to say, uh, I did not forget to introduce my wife and my daughters this morning. They threatened to kill me if I did. And so I had made a commitment to be here through Wednesday night. I didn't want to do that because it would have embarrassed them uh, immensely. But I do have some other guests here tonight, and that is my mom and dad uh, are here. And my middle, the middle of my three sisters, Mari, uh, is here as well. And so I'm thankful that they come, uh, or that they came to worship with us tonight. And just looking forward to uh, our time together and what God has in store for us. Take your Bibles, and I need you to turn to two places tonight. Um, Revelation chapter 19 and Matthew chapter 25. Um, I spoke this morning on uh, what was leading up to the, the catalyst uh, for the, the rapture of the church. And then we looked at the, the rapture, the sequence of it. We looked at the purpose of it. And lastly, we looked at the motivation. What should we be doing because Jesus is coming? That there's a work to be done. Amen? God has called us to a great and holy and eternal work. And he has placed each one of us, whomever we might be, where we are. Because wherever we are, there's darkness. There's, there's darkness all around. Amen? I mean, it doesn't matter where we go. I mean, my goodness, you can't go to Walmart without getting blindsided by darkness. Sometimes I wish I was blindsided, <laughs> or blinded at least, uh, because of what you might see or run into. But darkness is everywhere. And here's the reality is that Jesus himself declared himself to be the light of the world. And what he's called us to do is to reflect him. In the culture that we live in. He, we are to relate to Jesus like the moon relates to the sun. You know the moon has no light of its own. And God placed it in the sky, in the darkness, so that it could pick up light that we no longer can see. And reflect it on a world that would be dark and completely dark otherwise. And that's what God has called you and I to do, both individually, in, in, in and with our families, and ultimately in and with and through the church that God has called us to be a part of. God has placed each one of you here because there is a purpose in you, in your life. There is a gifting that he has given you, and there is an ability that you can use for his honor and his glory. And that's what he wants you to do. And so, but, but there, there is a reason. He, he wants people to be saved. He, he wants to be honored. He wants to be glorified because he knows as our creator what every person needs. No matter what they might think or feel that they need. God absolutely knows. Amen. Remember this morning, y'all. Don't make, I can come down there and amen myself, but it takes a long time. Don't make me do that. And I will do that. I do it at my church all the time. And, and they, some of them get a I got one guy in my church, his name is Will, and he says, that's my favorite part of every service. When you come, when you have to come down off the platform and amen yourself, so don't make me do it. Because I will. But there are two events that are going to take place, I believe, based on Scripture, 
in heaven after the rapture of the church. I want to briefly just mention one because where I was in my, in my introductory comments about the work that God has called us to do, there is this evaluation. It's called the Bema. Bema translated from Greek to English is simply this, the judgment seat. In Roman culture, that is where the, the governor sat. When Pilate sat and condemned Jesus, he was sitting on the Bema in Jerusalem. It was the place of position and authority. He was the only one that was allowed to be there. And there is a Bema in heaven. There is an evaluation, a judgment. Now remember, I already spoke this morning and reminded you that for those of us who were saved, this is not a condemnation. But it is an evaluation. The, the Bible talks to us and it tells us that our life is going to be put before God in some way, shape, or form. In, in, in some way, shape, or form, Paul describes this setting fire to our lives, to the, to the activity, to the thoughts and intentions of our lives. The Bible says that we're going to be held accountable for every idle word right. that we say. And so there is this time of evaluation, and Paul says it's going to be like this. The things that we do from heaven's perspective are either going to appear before God as gold and silver and precious stone. Now what happens to those things we know about earthly when we put gold in a fire, when we put silver in the fire, what happens to it? It becomes more purified through the refining process. Right. What happens to wood and hay and straw when you put the fire to it? It burns up completely. And, and Paul says, hey, you want to live your life in such a way that before God, from God's perspective, what your life produces, what you have to give to Jesus, takes the appearance of gold and silver and precious stones. And God will be honored and glorified. How sad it is to know that there are some and maybe even many who think that they have lived a life that pleases God because they went to church and they served on a and they did they did all kinds of good things. But ultimately what they thought was that getting saved was the end. And so what they did was they got saved and then they came and they sat and they soaked in churches. And sitting and soaking leaves the spoil. Right. God has said salvation is at the end. Salvation is the absolute beginning. And, and so we see these things that Matthew tells us in Matthew 6, 19 to 20, that we should lay up treasure in heaven. Why? Because thieves can break in and steal. Rust can get in and contaminate moths. Oh my goodness. Where do these things even come from? You can't ever find them and yet you can sure tell where they've been. And Jesus said, don't put your hope, don't put your trust don't put your treasure in things that will only last for a while. They're temporary. But put your life, put your focus, put your attention, give your heart to that which lasts forever. And then Jesus says this, where your treasure is, there, there, your heart will be also. That's right. Where your treasure is, what you really value is where your heart will be and your life will demonstrate. Why? Because out of the abundance, the overflow of the heart, our mouth speak and our hands work and our feet go. And so we need to remember that there is a time of evaluation that is coming for those who are truly saved. There are some that Matthew tells us that Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, in verses 21 to 23, depart from me. I never knew you. Who were these people? 
And they were people who were very religious. They looked apart. They dressed apart. They spoke apart. They even did so many things that had the appearance of being godly and glorifying to God. And ultimately they were. And Jesus had said, but I don't know you. And they thought, wait a minute, what do you mean you don't know us? Didn't we serve in your name? And didn't we attend in your name? Didn't we preach in your name? Didn't we give in your name? Didn't we visit in your name? Didn't we do all of these things in your name? And he's like, yeah, you did. And there were other people that are in heaven because of what you did. But the problem is this, I don't know you. Yeah. I know them because they repented of their sin. Amen. And they realized that they could not save themselves. And all you had was a good case of religion. You see, here's what religion is. Religion is a man-made effort to get to God. And Christianity is God coming for us when we have no way of getting to Him. That's the difference between Christianity and every other religion that is in the world today. Every other religion has some type of effort that I put in, and if I would put in the right effort at the right time, in the right place, then I can earn credit with God. The Bible says that our righteousness the very best moments of our lives are as filthy rags from God's perspective. That's why we need Jesus. Because when Jesus comes and he transforms our life and he forgives us of our sin and he saves us and he redeems us and he restores us and he justifies us just as if we had never sinned. And His grace is applied. And His mercy is applied. Then through Him, the Father looks at us. And all He sees is the righteousness. And the beauty. Amen. And the magnificence. And the glory of His Son. Amen. And we are welcomed into His presence because of what Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone has done for us. And what you don't want to be is to stand in front of Jesus on that day with a whole laundry list of things that you did for Him and yet you are a stranger. Because He is faithful and He is true and He is righteous and He is just and He is holy. And all of those things demands in him that he give you exactly what you deserve. Amen. Matthew 12 tells us, as I already mentioned, we've given account for every careless word. Who we're going to give an account to Jesus. Well, we're going to be standing before him. And we're going to be standing there alone. You I don't know about you, but I, I know a, a lot of people who say, well, you know what, I, I, I'm going to be able to do in front of Jesus exactly what I, I'm going to be able to deflect. I'm going to be able to put the attention on somebody else. No, when you have, when you have this conversation, it's just going to be you and him. Yeah. And he knows perfectly. Not just what we did, but the heart behind what we did, why we did it. Was it for our glory? Was it so that we would get patted on the back? Was it so that we would get recognized? Or was it so that men and women would come to know Jesus? Because he alone is the only one worth being honored and glorified. He is the only one that deserves our attention and he deserves our best. And so we go through and we, we look at these things uh, in the middle of Matthew 25, you had the parable of the talents, and we all know that the, the master gives one servant five talents according to his ability. He gives one three according to his ability. He gives one one according to his ability. He goes away for a long time. He doesn't tell them when he's coming back. He just says, hey, and take this and use it. You will be blessed by it, but I should benefit from it. Sometimes people think that Jesus has no expectation of us and we are completely wrong because the Bible says Jesus is the one telling the story, right? In Matthew 25, Jesus is the one telling the story and he says the master comes back and when he comes back, he says, hey, get the books out. Let's see what you did with what I gave you. 
And he didn't judge the one he had given three on the same standard that he judged the one he had given five. And he wasn't going to judge the, the, by the same standard the, the one that he had given three. He, he looked at each one of them individually and he said, what did you do with what I gave you? And the one with five said, hey, I took it and I doubled it and now I have ten. And what did he say in response? The words every one of us wants to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your master. All right. He called the one who he had given three. And this doesn't mean that this was all of them. This was just a record account of just three of them. This master had many servants. And he had given much and he expected much. And he didn't look at the three and said, Hey, you know what? I, I, I'm really... I, Appreciate what you did, but man, this was the rock star. He just looked at him and said, what'd you do with what I gave you? Well, Master, you gave me three. That's right, I gave you three. I turned your three into six. Well done. Well done. Right, amen. Well done. You have been faithful in the little things. I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your master. And he called the one that he had only given one to. And what did that servant say? Well, I knew how cruel, I knew how hard you were, and I didn't want to get in trouble, so well, I just took it and I buried it. And I, I'm giving you back everything that you gave me. And he said, no, 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 no that's not going to work. You could have at least put it in the bank so that when I came back, I would have at least made some interest off of what I gave you. Jesus expects something from you. That's right. Jesus expects something from me, but we don't do it to earn it. We do it because we love Him. We just want to be faithful. We see what He has given us, and we may not understand it all in the moment, but here's what Jesus expects. Do what you know to do with what you got now. So many people are like, well, if God would just show me, I would. If God would just do, I would. If, if it was just a different way, I would. No, God wants you to be faithful now. That's right. Amen. With all that He has given you, with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength, and we will be held accountable before Jesus That's right. one day of whether we did that or not. You will, and so will I. And what we want, what I want, you what, what you want, what we want together is to heal well done, but many won't because they didn't live, live a well done life. Right. We know where we want to be in the end, but the only way that we will have what we want in the end is to take the steps now that get us there. You can't take any way that you want and get home. I live in Hartsville, South Carolina, and, and there are a few ways that get me to the main road that I got to be on, but ultimately, there's only one way that I can go and get to my house. And I know you live around here, and I used to live around here, and I know a bunch of back roads, but here's the reality. Every way that you won't go won't get you home. And every one of you have got a favorite way that you're going to go when you leave here tonight. Why? Because that's the way that you know gets you where you want to be. And folks, God created us to be at home with Him. Amen. Amen. Our heart knows that this is not our home. That this is just a temporary situation. There's a lot of responsibility while we're here, but it's still temporary. We're going to spend a lot longer there yeah. than we will here. Right. And it doesn't make sense that we would take the opportunity that we have living here to prepare best for there. Because we want. Do, do you want to hear? Do you want to look in Jesus' face one day and hear him say, well done? If you do, it means you got to live a well done life now because you won't have that then if you don't live it. That's right. Now. See, James tells us this reality. Faith works. 
A lot of times we, we want to quote it in the negative the way that James, the half-brother of Jesus, put it, right? Faith without works is dead. The flip side, the flip side of that is to put it in a positive nature or make a positive statement. Faith works. And there are so many ways that we can take that. I don't know about you, but I'm glad faith works. I'm glad that when I put my faith, when I put my trust in Jesus, He doesn't let me down. I put my faith in you, you can put your faith in me and we'll fail each other. We'll mess up. I'll say something before this week is over. I promise that's going to make some of you mad. But I'll forgive you. Go get over it. It'll be all right. <laughs> It's just, it's just the nature of being human. We are all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of that, falling short, Paul writes in Romans 6, 23, is what? It's death. I'm glad that there's a comma there and not a period. Amen? Amen. The wages of sin is death, comma, but the gift of God is to turn alive through Jesus Christ, That's right. our Lord. There are some rewards that are going to be given. And what I love about this is that we are honored by Jesus for loving him and living for him. And our rightful response is we will lay these at his feet. But this is all with the, the Bema, right? The, the crown of righteousness can be received. You'll find it in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Who gets it? Those that love the Lord's appearing. We're talking about prophecy at the end times. We're talking about the appearing of the Lord. My granddaddy loved. He studied his whole life. He never got tired of looking at and reading about and studying about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And up until the moment that he died, he believed with every fiber of his being that he would live to see Jesus come back. He didn't, but Jesus came for him personally. That's right. <laughs> he didn't get the he didn't hear the trumpet. He didn't hear the, the archangel shout, but he heard Jesus say, Ed, come on. That's right. It's thrown me off the, this morning and, and this evening already because y'all are calling me stuff that I've only ever heard my granddaddy get called and it's freaking me out. <laughs> I'm, I'm not Reverend Madaris. I'm not Preacher Madaris. That was Granddaddy. I, I'm Mike. If you wanted to add it, you could call me Pastor Mike. That's what my church folks call me. Uh, don't call me Doc. Uh, I got my doctorate. I, I don't like Dr. Madaris. I, mostly people just call me Mike. That's, that's who I am. But Granddaddy, he just loved this. The crown of righteousness. I love that he instilled in us as his family a love for the Lord and a great expectancy for the coming of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 25 to 27 talk about the incorruptible crown. What is that? It's those who discipline their bodies, who exhibit self-control and live godly lives in the midst of an ungodly world. I, I'm the heaviest that I have ever been. In my life, I didn't like my granddaddy. He was always a big man, and I'm there myself now. I told my mama that I was old and fat now because I'm 50. And she's like, no, you're not. I'm like, yes, I am. I'm 50 years old, and I can stand on a scale. And when I do, it says one at a time, please. <laughs> <laughs> and part of it, I, I jokingly say, is because I misread what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Because I thought it said buffet the body, and so I've been going to go and corral my whole life, and that's not what he said. He said buffet, or buffet the body, not buff, buffet the body. <laughs> the crown of life can be received. James chapter 1 verse 12 talks about it. Romans chapter 2 verses 6 through 9 talk about the crown of life. Who gets this crown? Those who endure patiently through suffering. There's all kinds of suffering. And the Bible doesn't just lay out, well, it's only this kind of suffering. It's those who trust Jesus in the midst of difficulties that have the privilege of receiving this crown, the crown of life. 
from the Lord. There, there is a crown that I believe only pastors can earn or receive. And it's the crown of glory. First Peter chapter 5, verses 2 through 4 talk about this. And it's for godly leaders who were an example to the flock. I got to talk with several of uh, you who were here this morning who told me some stories about being here remembering my granddaddy as he pastored this church for 10 or 12, maybe more years than that. I'm not, I know he started in 1963. Daddy and I can't figure out when he left Fox uh, as the pastor, but it was a long time that he served here. And he, he, he married some of you that are in here, and, and he uh, ministered to some of your families, and, and you remember the ministry that he had here, and I believe because of his faithfulness and the godly example that he set in all of his life that he will receive the crown of glory, and I pray that I, in his footsteps and in my dad's footsteps, will be one who God deems as faithful in the way that I shepherded the sheep that he entrusted to me, that I faithfully preached the word and I loved and I cared for his people in a way that spurred them on to love him more and to follow him more closely. The last crown that I believe the scripture talks about, and there may be others, is the crown of rejoicing. Uh, my granddaddy always called it the soul winner's crown. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19, and Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, talk about this. And what is it? It is a reward for those who have led others to Christ. It's just people who love or fall in love or overcome fears and anxieties to tell people about Jesus. The book of Proverbs says, he who wins souls is wise. It's not just a New Testament thing. It's, it's all throughout. The, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is a story of God redeeming man. And so we have this bema that is in our future. And then we have... Uh, also, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I'm just going to read quickly uh, Revelation chapter 19, verses 1. Or actually, let's just let's read verses 7 through 10. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13 is a story, a parable that Jesus tells us. We have to remember it falls on the heels of what we refer to as Matthew chapter 24. Well, we looked at Jesus' teaching this morning of what the end times are going to look like and what is the catalyst of things that are going to transpire in the world around us before he comes. And immediately following that, he tells the story of these ten women. They're virgins. They have all been, they, they are part of this crucial wedding that is going on. And the Bible says this, that five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Now the Greek word there is actually the Greek word, or the, the Greek word that we get our word moron from. So these weren't the brightest bulbs in the box. And they come where they're supposed to come, in the time that they're supposed to come, but they are not prepared. And that's what distinguishes them. Because the Bible says that it, it, the, the bridegroom is delayed. They're all expecting him to come at a certain time, but he doesn't show up then. And they begin to fall off to sleep. And in the midst of all that's going on, time passes. And then... The shout comes. The bridegroom is here. And they all get up and they go to make those final last minute. Let's make sure everything, get the lamps going again. And five of them have oil and five of them don't. The ones that don't miss out. Accurate summary. 
of the text. Well, let's look at what the, the, the history was behind this because Jesus didn't talk about his coming and the rapture of the church. He didn't talk about himself being the bridegroom and us as Christians being the bride with a 2023 American marriage idea. Now, I'm not looking for, I actually, as I lay this out for you tonight, I would prefer that my daughters let us go through this process. One, because it puts the bill on the boy. I got two daughters. But here's what is going on in the Jewish custom that would have been front and center as Jesus was teaching this, they would have all been completely aware of this whole process. All right, so I'm going to go through it quick because we're running out of time. But the first is the betrothal. And there are multiple aspects of the betrothal, betrothal process. First, the father selects the potential bride to be for his son. I really like that. I think I will do a better job of picking out who's going to marry my daughters than they might. They don't agree. But what do they know? They're 18 and 14. You know, John 6, 44 says, no one comes, Jesus talking to me. This is Jesus. No one comes to me unless the Father who has given them to me draws them. What does that mean? It means that God, the Father, through the work of the Holy Spirit, and the preaching and teaching and proclaiming of the Word, reaches out and He draws People who aren't a part of the bride with an invitation to be a part of the bride by being saved. Right. And the Word and the Holy Spirit and, and all working in conjunction with the direction of God the Father. Salvation has always been God's plan. Always been right. God's plan. The father then sends a representative bearing gifts to the home of the potential bride to announce the desire for the wedding to take place. The father may go for himself, but depending on his stature, it was common for him to send someone else. We see this played out in Genesis chapter 24. Abraham has become an old man. He and Sarah makes him promise, don't let Isaac, don't let my boy marry one of these pagan heathens around here, you go and you find him a good and virtuous and pure bride. And so Abraham calls his most trusted servant. Anybody remember what that dude's name was? His name was Eliezer. You know what Eliezer means in Hebrew? Comfort. The father, Abraham, sent the comforter to a foreign land to bring a bride back for his son. Just think about that. And what has God the Father done on behalf of his son Jesus to gather a bride? Jesus called the Holy Spirit the helper and the comforter. In John chapter 15 and John chapter 16, can you? It's just you, you begin to see, man, God paints beautiful pictures. Yes. He paints amazing pictures. And so often, man, we have to shed off this American idea of Bible and Jesus. And we have to dig in because there are some beautiful things that God shares with us that just don't jump off the page in our English Bibles, but if we will do just a little study, it is amazing the, the beauty that God will show us Amen. in His Word that helps Amen. us not just to see beautiful pictures, but helps us to understand the message behind what He's doing. Once we have the, the, this initial contact and, and there is mutual agreement between the one sent by the, the, the Father to negotiate and the Father of the Bride to be there is a negotiation of the mohar. What is that? It's the price of the bride. Now, they negotiate what? Now, in that day, the, the most valuable commodities were livestock. And so it was, is she a 10 cow bride? Is she a 100 sheep bride? And what, what is the cost? And, and the cost is not determined 
by the father of the bride. The cost is determined by the price that the father of the groom is willing to pay. Here's the reality. The world tries to value you. Your friends try to place a value on you. Your job tries to place a value on you, and all of them get it wrong. That's right. They don't get to determine the price. The price is determined by the one who is set to purchase you. And God said, I value you so much that I'm willing to give the life of my son. For you. That is how valuable you are. Amen. And that doesn't come from the world. That comes from your heavenly father. And there are times when the world is going to beat you down and say that you are junk. And you just remember the price that God paid for you. The precious blood of Jesus was spilled. That's how valuable you are to him. The next thing was the formal proposal. And this is where it gets inter interesting because a covenant, a, a marriage covenant is established at this point. It's at this point that the bridegroom presents the formal document which lists the specifics of the marriage contract. The Hebrew word for bridegroom means the one who enters covenant. Folks, we have the covenant. Yeah. God has given it to us. He's, he's following this step for step. He wants us to understand what his plan is. In this document, it states exactly how the bridegroom will take care of the bride in every way. He promises to meet all of her needs. Well, again, I look at my daughters and my daughter Morgan who is fixing to go off a uh, freshman in college and she's got a young boy that is bound and determined that he is going to marry her one day. And I just told him the other day, son, we've got a lot of talking to do before you get to that point. <laughs> We're we going to have a come to Jesus meeting and, and there's going to be some things going to be set in stone before you get my daughter. I can promise you that. I ain't never been to jail, but I've always wondered what it would be like to have an in-house jail ministry. Because so, <laughs> I ain't afraid to go, I promise you. But the New Testament, Jesus said, is a new covenant and in it he promises to meet all of our needs. He said it himself in Matthew chapter 6, verses 28 to 30, and then 33, he says, look, all of these things, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. He's promised. Paul writing to the church at Philippi, and he, he writes to them in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, one of my favorite verses in the book of Philippians. You remember what it says? And my God will supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory Amen. in Christ Jesus. I mean, He is desires. He has planned to take care of you. That's right. All He wants you to do is to love Him first and love Him most above all that. That's why when Jesus was confronted and said, he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he didn't even hesitate. He said, love the Lord your God. It's written. It's in the scripture. It's as plain as the nose on your face. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. And everybody was expecting him to stop. Right? But he didn't. And he said, the second is like that. Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. And if you'll love everybody else as much as you love yourself, you'll feel, fulfill all of God's word. Because all of the commandments, all the prophecies, all of scripture hang on those two things. Love God and love others. The next, you have the bridegroom's statement of promise and during this formal proposal this takes place and it was customary for him to read or quote Hosea chapter 2 verses 19 and 20 and it just says this I will betroth you to me forever yes I will betroth you to me in righteousness 
and in compassion, and I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. And you will know the Lord. And then you have this beautiful element. It's called the Brit. And it's, it, it's a time of, of choosing. You see, so, so often we think, well, man, this is awful. What The bride, she's not a part of the negotiation. She's not considered. And, oh, this is where she gets considered. Because what happens in the Brit is that there is a cup of wine that was brought out. Because in the midst of all of this, the bride and her, or all of her friends and the rest of the family is brought in to witness this part. Absolutely amazing. And this cup of wine is given to the groom, to that, to that bridegroom. And he takes it and he offers it to her and he sets it down. And she doesn't have to say a word. Her actions say it all. She's got two options. She can turn around and walk away. And that's like, thanks, but no thanks. I'm not interested in you. She has a choice. You hear me? She has a choice. The opportunity to be united with the bridegroom is presented and she can say yes by picking up that cup and drinking it and then offering it to him. And in that, without saying a word, she says yes. If she leaves it, she turns around and walks away or just stands there and doesn't touch it, that's no, and nobody can do anything about it. Everything stops right then. You remember what Jesus did with his disciples in the upper room? As he instituted the Lord's Supper on the night that he was betrayed. He had broken the bread, gave thanks, passed it around to them. They ate it. And he was like, this is, represents my body that's broken for you. Eat this and do it often and remember me. And then the Bible says that he gave them a cup after that. And he handed it to them. And he said, take this and drink it, all of you. And remember me. He's offering. The, the picture is that he's offering this. That there is that reality that the disciples understand. They're seeing this because all of these pieces are falling together throughout the ministry of Jesus. And, and they begin to see what is going on. And although they don't fully understand, right? right? Even to that point, they still don't understand. Even after he was resurrected from the grave and appeared to them in the upper room the first time, it says they did not yet understand. Folks, you don't have to understand it all to love him. You don't have to understand it all to follow him. You don't have to understand it all to surrender to him. You just have to love him and follow him and surrender in the moment that you live, in the today of this moment. After that decision was made, if it went forward, there was another uh, statement of commitment that uh, the, the bridegroom would say to the bride, listen to this, you are set apart or consecrated for me according to the law of Moses and Israel. And then he would say, I am going to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and take you to be with me <coughs> forever. Does that sound as right? Yeah. John 14? Yeah. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, if that was not true, I would have told you it's not true. But it is true. Right. And I am going to prepare a place for you. Amen. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will <coughs> one day come again and receive you to myself that where I am there, you may be also. That's right. What an amazing thing. And then, there was a time of separation. Folks, are, are, you, are you following me? Can, can you see this unfolding? The time of separation, it was often for a year. And during this time of separation, the bridegroom 
was to prepare everything necessary to be married. Today, it's the woman's responsibility. It's the woman's family to make all of those preparations and get everything lined up. And I'm glad for me. I mean, it worked out well. My wife did a great job of all that. I didn't have anything to do with it. She told me where to go to get my tux. I went. She told me what time the wedding was going to be, and I showed up. I walked away with a wife. <laughs> Y'all know if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but in this, in Jesus' day, in Jesus' culture, none of that fell on the bride. And so the groom, the, 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 the bridegroom would go away to the father's house. They most often, it because of the family nature, uh, that he began to prepare a special place for he and his bride at his father's house. He had to build it. He had to stock it. He had to furnish it. He had to decorate it. He had to do all that he needed to do. And I'm sure with mama's help, but daddy's approval, he would come every day. Hey, daddy, come, come see the progress that I made today. Can I go get her? No, son. It's not ready. There's more work to be done. So he'd get back, and he would work, and the next week he would come back. Daddy, I've made a whole lot of progress. Come look. Can I go, can I go get her? Can I go get her? There's, there's still work to be done and over and over and over again. I mean, he's, he's working it, just trying to get everything right. And one day, the father comes and he inspects it. And I'm sure mama was inspecting it too. Because you're like, yeah, I'm making sure that he makes you do what he didn't do that I sure would have wanted him to do. Yeah. But when the time was right and Mama gave Daddy permission to give the boy permission, he was out of there. <laughs> Look at his split. Right, he'd been sitting on go. He'd been anxious. Why? Because he's doing all this because his love and his heart belongs to his bride and he is ready for them to be together forever. And so he gathers his friends together. And this happens most often at night because they want it to be a surprise. They would literally go and steal the bride away. So they sneak up and you got this whole uh, entourage of groomsmen and whatever they may have been called. But there's this huge party that's there. And they show up and the closer that they get, the quieter that they get. And they get right up to the house of the bride and they all just begin to shout and scream the bridegroom has come the bridegroom has come Amen. and he goes in and he grabs her now why she got all these other people because they're supposed to get all her stuff and they bring it to the bridegroom's house and the ceremony is complete at the bridegroom's house and everything is there and they go in and these celebrations in Jew Jewish culture in Jesus' day would often last a period of seven days. When you get into Daniel and you get days become years and all this kind of stuff, right? You, right. you, you tracking with me? The Bible, the, the, the tradition was that after that marriage had been consummated, as forever proof that the bride was pure, the bridegroom would take the sheets off the wedding bed and they would be stained with the blood that was there. And he would take those sheets and all that they meant and signified and he would carry it to the Father. And he would store it away forever that the bride was as pure as she was supposed to be. You know what the Bible says? That one day Jesus is going to come back. He's going to be wearing a white robe stained with the blood of the Lamb. The price Amen. that was demanded. The price that guaranteed the purity of all who were invited Amen. to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that 
that's going to take place in heaven during that seven year period of time when as glorious as it's going to be, all hell is going to be breaking loose on earth. Are you ready? The scripture tells us that one day like a thief in the night, the bridegroom is going to come. And no man knows the day or the hour, just one day, it's going to happen. And then it will forever be too late. If you aren't ready to, as I said this morning, today is the day of salvation. Now is the best time you'll ever have to surrender your life to Christ and embrace the free gift of salvation, not that you earn, but that God provided even though you don't deserve it. God gave it through his son to you and me, and we don't deserve it, and we can't earn it, and we can never do enough good to, to even come close to deserving. It's free gift. It's free. The price was great. The price was demanded and the price was paid in full. And he did it because he loves us so much. And this is what will take place. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 19 in those verses that I read, Rejoice. It's time for the marriage of the Lamb. And I believe that it's very soon. Amen. And I would imagine being here on a Sunday night, most everybody in the room would say that you're a Christian. One, the Bible says, make sure you are. And if you are, God will tell you. And if you aren't, God will tell you that too, but not because he hates you. Because he loves you. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for a friend, and he lay down his life for you, and there's no greater choice that you could ever make than to accept the free gift of salvation that he offers because he loves you. The second question is this. Do you love others enough to tell them about the Jesus that you know? Who are you praying for? I was asked this question not long ago by a preacher friend, and it just rocked me to the core. And it was this. If God decided today to save everybody that I prayed for over the last week, how many people would get saved? What's your prayer list look like? It's not that we don't need to pray for people that are sick and hurting and desperate and that kind of stuff, but if we're not praying for what is first on God's heart, we need to start. Because if we pray for Him, We'll begin to love them so much that we'll tell them at some point in time we'll overcome whatever fear and anxiety, we'll overcome whatever excuse we might be able to put together because we know one day he's coming and when he does, it's settled forever. So I want to invite you tonight. Trust me if you don't know him. But if you do, you can't undo or redo what has already passed. But you can take from this moment forward and you begin, you can begin to pray and minister and love on people who are lost because the only hope that they have is to be saved by Jesus. That's it. With our heads bowed and with our eyes closed, God, the Lord, you're going to come. The hymn of invitation. <coughs> It's just simple. We're, just, we're not even going to sing long tonight. Just a verse, maybe two verses of the hymn of invitation. But here's the reality. We ought to know. I guarantee you, you know, you know what God wants you to do, and you've already chosen what you're going to do. So whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. Jesus, give us the courage now to follow you, trust you, and obey you in this moment in time. I pray we would never be the same. I pray that this world would never be the same because of what you do in your people tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name.